Right, part seven of At Home in Mitford. We are now on chapter 12. We'll be following along, page 180 in this particular book. <clears throat> this is the nice one with the leaves and things on the cover. Very autumnish sort of cover. Anyways, uh, for our last bit, Dooley is now Dooley is now living with Father Tim for the moment, temporarily, because his grandfather, Russell Jacks, is in the hospital with pneumonia. Uh, so, there are also some jewels concealed in a burial urn in Lord's Chapel, which we don't know where they came from. We don't know how they got there. And Cynthia has given Father Tim a Christmas present without even mentioning the gruesome multicolored bump on his head, caused by Dooley smacking him with a tennis shoe as he crept up the stairs, trying to say, keep from waking Dooley. Anyway, chapter 12, an empty vessel. The news from the hospital was not good. Russell Jacks was stable, but not improving. Pneumonia takes a lot of forms, said Hoppy. For a man Russell's age, this is the worst form. We're doing all we can, and there's still hope, but it's like swimming upstream. Russell's name was listed on the prayers of the people at Lord's Chapel and put on a community-wide prayer chain. Father Tim wasn't surprised to, th to see the concerns of his parishioners. They, carried, they cared about the taciturn old man, whose tender heart was revealed only in the showy perennials, elaborate paths, and manicured borders of the church gardens. Food poured into the rectory to assist with the unexpected duty of having a boy to feed. Grown boys is bottomless pits, said Percy, who sent fresh potato salad and pimiento cheese. Winnie Ivy delivered donuts, cream horns, and a coconut cake. Miss Sadie had Luther drive over with a bag of Swanson chicken pies and a Sara Lee pound cake, and the Altar Guild broke, brought, the Altar Guild brought a roasted turkey. I ain't never seen nothing like this, confessed Dooley, who was able to choose from more than a dozen lunch options. I ain't, I've never seen anything like it myself, and that's a fact, said Father Tim as they sat at the kitchen counter. Soon he would have to deal with Dooley's English, but as he'd just begun dealing with please and thank you, he didn't want to push his luck. His eye fell on a manila envelope that Cynthia Coppersmith had delivered several evenings ago in a drenching rain, in which he'd tucked among the books he'd kept on the counter. I hope you'll open it tonight, she had said. He was deeply ashamed that he'd forgotten. How could he have forgotten? He had stuck it between a couple of books on the shelf so he wouldn't spill tea on it, thinking he'd take it up to bed. Then he'd forgotten it completely. Whatever might be inside, he clearly didn't deserve it. He slipped the gift from the envelope and removed the wrapping paper so it wouldn't tear. You know how I could tell I was getting old, his mother once said. I began to save used wrapping paper. It was a matted watercolor of a furry creature dressed in a dark suit with a clerical collar and horn-rimmed glasses perched on the end of its nose. The little creature had small toes on its furry feet, a very large smile, and a pair of engaging eyes. Father Telpidae, read the caption at the bottom. That's funny, said Dooley, peering over his shoulder. The rector thought it was the most charming creature he'd seen in years, better even than Beatrix Potter might have imagined. Father Telpidae, read a legend on the back, is the good rector of a small parish located under the green grass of Father Tim's rectory garden in Mitford. Father Telpidae says he's happy to announce that his congregation is growing and that he has absolutely no plans to retire. Mole, Webster informed him, or L. Telpidae. He laughed as heartily as he'd laughed in a long time. It ain't that funny, said Dooley. That's your opinion. I like it when you laugh, said Dooley. It makes it more fun around here. Then I'll try to laugh more often, he said, still chuckling. Hadn't he recently promised Cynthia Coppersmith that very thing? That evening, he and Dooley walked Barnabas to the monument and looked in all the shop windows. Boxwood wreaths hung on the doors, and windows were garlanded with tiny, tiny winking lights. Mitford at Christmas was a fairyland. If only the Christmas snow hadn't fallen at Thanksgiving. Dooley examined the displays in every window, from cufflinks and sports jackets at the collar button 
to iron skillets, fishing tackle, and tree stands at the hardware. As they turned the corner and headed home, he was sure he saw Andrew Gregory's gray Mercedes parked in front of the little house next door. Hot chocolate? he asked Dooley, when they'd taken off their coats. He felt oddly absent-minded, unable to concentrate. He'd recently seen Andrew's car parked in that precise spot at least five times. No, maybe six, he thought, setting the saucepan on the stove. No, thank you. Milk and fruitcake? No, no, thank you. What then? Nothing. Dooley had recently turned mournful, as Russell called it. You know what I'd do? Puny had said on Wednesday. I'd give him a swift kick. Just say, bend over, honey, and walk. You'd see a different young'un. My grandpa wouldn't no more and let me get away with being ill to being ill to him than he could fly. Blam, he yanked me up and preached me a sermon that'd scorch the hair off my head. I have great respect for that approach, but it's not one I could administer effectively. He'd get along better if he was part Baptist. You may be interested to know that I'm precisely one half Baptist. She looked at him suspiciously. My mother was a fervent Baptist, and my father was a lukewarm Episcopalian. Lukewarm? I don't even like my dishwater lukewarm. Puny, what if Russell Jacks doesn't make it? What will we do with Dooley? Did you ever find out what's the matter with his mama? Alcohol. I don't know the whole story. She let all five of her children go. Puny was silent for a long time as she cleaned the silver and put it in soapy water. Well, she said, maybe he don't need a kick in the tail after all. Oh, maybe what he, what he needs is just a whole lot of loving. Now there, he thought, there is an idea I can get my teeth into, in a manner of speaking. Puny, he said, that is splendid thinking. So splendid, in fact, it deserves special recognition. Please dry your hands. He went into the study and took the cream-colored envelope for his, from his desk drawer and gave it to her at the sink. Merry Christmas. She looked in the envelope, saw the hundred-dollar bill, and burst into tears, just as Dooley came in with Barnabas. Poop on that old puzzle you're making me do, he said, glaring at Puny. Father Tim saw the color rise in her cheeks. That's the stupidest thing, stupidest thing I ever seen, said Dooley. I throwed it in the trash. You know what I'm going to do to you, she snapped. What's that? I'm going to jerk a knot in your tail. She moved toward him with fire behind the fresh tears in her eyes. Dooley backed into Barnabas, who yelped and fled down the hall. But you know what I'm going to do first? She grinned wickedly at Dooley, whose eyes were wide with alarm. I'm going to grab you and give you a great big hug. Oh, no, you ain't. As he pounded up the stairs, Puny turned to the rector. There, she said, looking triumphant. That'll fix him for a while. On the afternoon of Christmas Eve, Father Tim and Dooley planned to visit Russell, who was sitting up and no longer needed oxygen. Let's drop by Mitford Blossoms, said Father Tim, and take Russell a Gloxinia. On the way, what is a Gloxinia? I presume some sort of flower. If you know, feel free to comment. On the way, they stopped at the drugstore where he brought, bought a bag of jelly beans for Hoppy and a Reese's cup for Dooley. When they walked in the florist shop, he was surprised to see Hoppy standing at the counter, dressed in a hospital scrub suit, his navy pea jacket, boots lined with sheepskin, a worn khaki raincoat, and a cap with ear flaps. Left hospital on the run, he said, grinning. My friend, it looks like you were dressed by Miss Rose Watson. Hoppy laughed. A glorious laugh, thought Father Tim, and one he hadn't heard in far too long. These are the best we have, said Jenny Ivy, as she came out of the cooler with a bucket of roses. Hello, Father. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Dooley. That's my Sunday school teacher, Dooley whispered to the doctor. Jenna proudly set the bucket on the counter. What do you think, pal? asked Hoppy. You're the Rosarian. Jenna's roses were grown in Holland, a fact that made them considerably more expensive but they never drooped their heads after a day in the vase, and they always smelled like roses. He nodded his strong approval. Two dozen, Poppy said, taking out his wallet. And Jenna, please deliver them right away. You know the house. As Jenna arranged the stems in a long pink box, he turned to the rector. She's practically quit speaking to me, he said. She? You know, Olivia. Aha. From cool to freezing. Father Tim felt his heart beat dully. 
He had an impulse to take Hoppy across the street to the church office and tell him the truth at once. But no, he made a promise, and the promise was to tell him after Christmas. After the joy and trepidation of sending two dozen splendid roses, after Olivia's delight and sorrow in receiving them. Good Lord, why did this have to happen to two of the finest people he knew? You're mighty quiet. Do you know something I don't know? Asked Hoppy. The rector reached into his jacket pocket. All I know is this bag contains at least 11 green jelly beans as I counted every one I could see through the wrapper. Merry Christmas. Hoppy laughed as he opened the bag. Are you going to see Russell? We are. My car's out front. I'll give you a lift. As they were leaving with the purple gloxinia, Dooley tugged at Father Tim's sleeve. Wait a minute, he said, and went back to the counter where he handed Jenna Ivy his Reese's cup. At the hospital, they stood outside Russell's open door and talked. It's a bit of a miracle, said Hoppy. I think he may pull out of it, but there's another problem. What's that? He could be down for months. The best way to recover from this is to get plenty of bed rest. That means he won't be able to take care of the boy. In fact, he's going to need someone to take care of himself. He's going to need some care himself. Well, said Father Tim, at a loss for words. Dooley stood by the bed, looking anxiously at his grandfather. The old man was weak and spoke with his eyes closed. Dooley, are you behaving yourself? Nope. Don't shame me, boy. You hear? All right, Grandpa. I won't. Before he left, Dooley took his grandfather's hand. Grandpa, he said, don't die. Russell Jacks opened his eyes and looked at his grandson with a faint smile. All right, boy, I won't. According to parishioners, the Christmas Eve masses at Lord's Chapel were more beautiful, more powerful, more stirring than ever before. Candles burned on the fresh windowsills. On, on the windowsills. I don't think they were fresh. Among fragrant boughs of spruce and pine. Fresh gardens. There's... There's where we picked up that word. Sometimes my eyes skip to another line and I randomly borrow words from it. Apologies. Fresh garlands wrapped the high cedar beams over the nave. A glorious tree from Meadowgate Farm stood near the pulpit and a lush, a lush garden of cream-colored poinsettias sprang up around its feet. In the midnight service especially, there was an expectant hush that went beyond the usual reverent silence before the service, and someone said that for the first time in her life, she had felt the sweet savor of the Christ child in her heart. Once in royal David's city stole, stood a lowly cattle shed, where a mother laid her baby in a manger for his bed. Someone who was out walking in the balmy air heard a great wealth of music pouring from the little stone church, music with a poignant clarity and purpose. This child, this helpless little boy, shall be our confidence and joy. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Miss Rose came on the arm of Uncle Billy, wearing her new black suit and fuchsia coat, and a pair of red and navy argyles with unlaced saddle oxfords. We're getting there, Uncle Billy said to Father Tim after the service. You might say we got a pretty good ways past the head, but we ain't made it to the toll. As he headed home with Dooley at nearly 1.30 in the morning, he felt deeply grateful, but uncommonly fatigued. He had never been able to decide when to open his gifts. He could hardly do it on Christmas Eve, when he arrived home past 1 a.m. after preaching two services, and on Christmas morning, conducting two masses kept him at Lord's Chapel until well past noon. I play it by ear, he once told Emma, who couldn't imagine not opening presents any time she felt like it, starting on or before December 15th. At nearly two o'clock in the morning, they sat on the floor with hot chocolate and Winnie's donuts, and he gave Dooley his presents from Miss Sadie, Puny, Emma, and one from himself, a wool scarf from the collar button. Miss Sadie had sent two pocket handkerchiefs, a pair of shoelaces, and a five-dollar bill wrapped in aluminum foil and tied with a red ribbon. Puny had given him a yellow windbreaker, and there were two dozen Reese's cups from Emma. Dooley sat mournfully in the midst of his gift. I wanted that old bicycle. The way your earnings are piling up, you'll have it before long. Now, I'd like to open your present to me. Wait till morning. You ain't going to like it anyway. I'd appreciate making that decision myself. Wait till morning. I'm give out, Dooley said irritably. 
It was 2.30 when the pair trudged upstairs, well behind Barnabas, who was already sprawled at the foot of the bed and snoring. On the landing, he put his hand on Dooley's shoulder. I'll be awake before daylight. I'll be awake before daylight, preparing for two services, and you may definitely expect to hear some creeping on the stairs. But if I catch you coming after me with a shoe, I'll be dead meat. Precisely. At 6.30, he and Barnabas woke Dooley. I don't want to get up, he wailed. You done wore me out going to church. I ain't never been to so much church in my life. I didn't know there was that much church in the whole darn world. My friend, you will be pleased to know that Santa Claus visited this humble rectory last night and left something in the study for one Dooley Barlow. There ain't no Santy. I don't believe that old poop. Well then, lie there and believe what you like. I'm going downstairs and have my famous Christmas morning casserole. Barnabas leapt on Dooley's bed and began licking his ear. This old dog is the hatefulest thing I ever seen, Dooley moaned, turning his face to the wall. Come, Barnabas, leave him be. Barnabas lay resolutely on Dooley's bed and stared at his master. Barnabas, at least, was determined to execute Puny's good idea. He set two places at the counter and took the bubbling sausage casserole from the oven. There would be no diet this day. Then he turned on the record player and heard the familiar, scratchy strains of the Messiah. Dooley appeared at the kitchen door, dressed in the burgundy robe. Sounds like an army's moved in down here. My friend, you have hit the nail on the head. It is an army of the most glorious voices in recent history, singing one of the most majestic musical works ever written. Dooley rolled his eyes. I believe you've been asked to sit with Jenna Ivy and your Sunday school friends this morning, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, sir. No response. Directly after Christmas, he would deal with this pig-headed behavior to the fullest. I ain't feeling too good. Is that right? What's the trouble? I puked up something green. Really? It had a lot of brown in it, too. The walk to church will revive you. You've been going pretty strong, keeping to a rector's schedule. Why don't you look in the study and find out what Barnabas is up to? He followed the boy into the study to see what he'd been imagining for weeks. The look of joyful astonishment on Dooley Barlow's face. Dooley really hadn't seemed well, he concluded. As he walked home from church, he promised to stay right there. He promised to stay right there on the study sofa, looking at his new bicycle and drinking Seven Up. Though he'd received three invitations to Christmas dinner with parishioners, he wanted nothing more than to go home and crash. Later, if Dooley felt like it, they'd take the new bike up to the schoolyard and over to the Presbyterian parking lot. There was only one problem with that plan. Dooley could not be found in the study, nor anywhere else in the house and neither could the new red bicycle. The down jacket was missing from the peg, and the gloves weren't in the bin. And while he easily located the handkerchiefs and shoestrings from Miss Sadie, the windbreaker, the five-dollar bill, and the Reese's, Reese's cups had vanished. Nurse Herman said she hadn't seen Dooley, and no, she wouldn't mention this call to Russell. He drove the motor scooter through the school playground and then to the Presbyterian parking lot. He rode up and down Main Street twice, circled the war monument, and checked the lot behind the post office. There was hardly a soul to be seen on the streets, though Christmas lights in the shop windows winked cheerfully. He slowed at the corner of Old Church Lane, then turned left at his office, left at his office, and headed up the hill to Fernbank. Perhaps the boy had taken the bike to show Miss Sadie, he thought. There was no sign of a visitor at the silent white mansion, nor even Miss Sadie's car. Coasting down the hill in the increasingly chill wind, he came to a single desperate conclusion. Dooley Barlow had run away. Rodney Underwood answered the phone over the uproarious giggles of his three small daughters. Oh, he's just gone out for a little spin, said the police chief. Maybe he went out to Farmer on all them dirt roads. The rector was convinced that Dooley Barlow would not take his new red bike on a dirt road. The boy was gone. He could feel it in his bones, and he knew he could trust the feeling. Rodney said he'd personally file a missing persons report and send an officer out in a cruise car. Don't you worry, Father. You can't lose a red-headed boy on a red bicycle. We'll find him. After he talked to Rodney, he went to the hospital, where Russell Jacks was sitting up, and with some effort, eating a bowl of soup. Dooley wanted to come, Russell, but early this morning he, uh, threw up. Phew, did he? The old man asked with evident pride. The heat in the small room was stifling. Father Tim removed his jacket and sat down by the bed. You know, Russell, I've been wondering about his mother. Has she had any help? Gets food stamps and all, and I've tried to help. I understand, but help with her drinking. 
Went off to Broughton one time to dry out. Come back, started up again. His hand shook so that soup spilled down the front of his hospital gown. Father Tim felt miserably guilty about asking such questions on a day when the sick needed special cheering. What's your daughter's name, by the way? And where does she live? Her name's Pauline. Married a fellow Barlow, worked on the new highways they put through there. Give her five little young'uns in a, in a row, got them highways built, then jumped on one and went. Didn't come back. He had never ceased to be astonished by the weight of sorrow in the world. A veil of tears, the poet had called it, and rightly so. And she's still down in holding? I hope to God she is. Has a warm place to live, I expect. Old trailer over behind Shoney's. She worked there a while till they run her off for drinking on the job. There, that was enough to go on. He'd call Rodney from the phone in the waiting room. Russell, said the rector, brightening his tone and changing the subject. If you could have just one Christmas wish, wish what might it be? Russell pushed the soup bowl away and wiped his mouth with a trembling hand. Then he lay back on the pillow and closed his eyes so that Father Tim thought for a moment he hadn't heard the question. Then he said, I wish Ida was still living. She'd be a blessing to the boy. And I wish the rhododendrons would set their buds real good so we get a nice show of bloom come spring. He liked it to be where he could reach for it and find it immediately. Yet he could not find his small, worn, leather-bound Bible with his name stamped on the cover. He turned on the lights above the pulpit and once again searched the empty shelf. He walked angrily back to the office. That Bible contained marginal notes and special references that were irreplaceable. Who would have been so thoughtless to move it? And where did they move it and why? Missing Bibles, missing cakes, missing boys, Emma said, as if she were filing a report. Has Rodney called? Not since he talked to you at ten o'clock. On Christmas afternoon, Rodney had notified the holding police, giving them Parlene Barlow's name and the location of the trailer. Holding had called back to say the trailer had been moved, and they were continuing to investigate. We're going into the third day, he thought anxiously. Emma had fielded the phone calls. No, we don't know a thing yet. Thank you for calling. We appreciate it. We have no idea. Yes, we'll let you know. He noticed she'd begun dabbing at her eyes with that wad of toilet tissue she always carried. Are you all right? He asked. That was when she finally said it. That poor little orphan, getting something wasn't was responsible enough to own. I hate to say I told you so. He turned and blurted angrily. And for God's sake, don't say it. When he went home for lunch, Puny was back from her holiday with his sister. He told her about Dooley. Her face went white. I could have told you so, she said. Ah, oh, the everlasting smugness of people. He might have sighed, but thoughts of the Thanksgiving, thought, the thought of the thanks box, which now contained eleven dollars worth of his infernal sighing, stopped him. Dad Gummit, said Puny as he left for the left for the office. I'm worried sick about that little poop head. She burst into tears and ran down to the hall to the kitchen. According to Puny, who later saw Emma at the local, he had picked at his lunch like a bird and looked kind of grey-coloured. Hmm, snorted Emma, who was still nettled from her brush with the rector. If you ask me, he's acting exactly like he did before he got diabetes. But he can't be getting it again if he's already got it. So maybe he's getting something else, Emma said airily. Nothing is more wearying, Agatha Christie had said, than going over things you have written and trying to arrange them in proper sequence, or turn them the other way around. He couldn't agree more, he thought, as he struggled with his sermon. Directly after the meeting with the stranger in the nave, his sermons had seen a definite upturn. He was nearly jubilant afterwards. Then suddenly he felt that he was right back where he started. The trouble with you, Walter had said in a recent phone conversation, is that you're too prepared. You don't give the Holy Spirit room to do wondrous things. You need to take risks now and then. That's what makes life snap, crackle, and pop. Snap, crackle, and pop? Not only did people love saying they told you so, they were infernally full of advice. He looked at the calendar clock on his desk. If the boy didn't turn up in the next few hours, he and Miss Sadie had agreed to drive to Holding, where they'd go over the town with a fine-tooth comb. I've got new tennis shoes, he told him. I'll go up one side of the street, and you go up the other. Listen to this, the rector said to Barnabas, who was sprawled at his feet. As he read the first draft of his sermon, Barnabas listened with sincere interest. Actually, he found his dog more attentive than many of his congregation. On the other hand, none of his congregation ever openly engaged in vigorous scratching, so it was a wash. 
He got up and walked to the tall spruce with its twinkling lights and looked at the array of gifts still lying beneath it. He had lost the heart to finish opening them somehow, though he'd torn right into his cousin's gift and discovered that it was indeed an electric train. As soon as Dooley comes back, he thought, we'll set it up. Surely Dooley would be coming back. Suddenly he remembered the present Dooley had made for him and found it lying near Winnie's bulky gift. He opened it eagerly, a glasses case made at school. Two pieces of leather glued together on three sides and monogrammed with the aid of a stencil. F.T. was printed on one side, D.B. on the other. I put my initials on it, Dooley had scrawled on a piece of notebook paper, so you won't forget me. Forget Dooley Barlow. Never. Many boys who'd been raised like Dooley, he reasoned, would be good for nothing. Dooley, he was convinced, was extraordinarily good for something. It only remained to be seen what it was. He wished he had someone in the house to talk to about this disturbing turn of events, like Walter, with whom he'd shared nearly every confidence since he was a boy. He put the list, he put the glasses case in his shirt pocket and walked back to his desk. Talk to Halpy, tell Rodney, thank Cynthia, were scrawled across the top of his desk calendar. He decided to work his list backward. Cynthia, he thought, did not have much trouble making herself at home. When he'd called to thank her for the mole watercolor, she'd suggested tea, and he said he had just put the kettle on. In barely two minutes, she had popped through the hedge, as she liked to say, and curled up on his study sofa, helping herself to a piece of shortbread. He was intrigued to see that another of her pink curlers, obviously overlooked, adorned the back of her head. I'm so sorry, she said when told about Dooley. I always thought runaway boys come straight home when they got hungry. Yes, well, that is complicated by the fact that this is not his home. Has anyone seen him? Rodney says he was seen by three different people on his way down the mountain. They remembered the red bicycle. Did they say anything else? They said he was, uh, flying. Flying? Oh, dear. There was a thoughtful silence. I've never raised a boy, said Cynthia. That makes two of us. But I do try to understand their feelings. I always pretend I'm a child when I write violent books, and then I write exactly what I want to hear. Is that the way he should write his sermons, saying exactly what he would like to hear? A publisher who looked at the first manuscript said, Oh, we can't print this. It's far too silly. <coughs> but the next publisher understood. And there have been eight since then, all silly. And all successful, I believe. Well, yes. And then the Devant Medal was announced and we went into second and third printings of everything. But my point was, let's try and put ourselves in his shoes, even if it seems silly. It might work. Let's see. If I were a boy with a new bicycle... Where would I go? She stared intently at the fire, wrinkling her forehead. We think he's gone to his mother, but we can't trace her. Where does she live? She had a trailer down in Holding, but it's been moved. We could go and ask around the neighborhood where she lived. Somebody would know something. The police are doing that. They haven't turned up anything. I hate this, she said. I hate it more. How, he wondered, could he be sitting here by a warm fire when a fatherless boy was out there somewhere? almost certainly cold and hungry. There was a knock at the back door. His heart pounded as Barnabas leapt from his place in front of the fire and skidded into the kitchen. Rodney. Surely it would be Rodney with some news. When he opened the door, Dooley Barlow looked him straight in the eye. My mama told me to come back. Come in, the rector said hoarsely. There was an ugly welt on the boy's face. Barnabas licked it while Dooley silently removed his gloves, the down jacket and their yellow windbreaker. He dropped the gloves in the bin and hung the jackets on the peg. Come and say hello to Miss Coppersmith. Dooley met Cynthia's gaze without wavering. Hey, he said. Hey yourself. His face was red from pedaling in a chill wind, and he trembled slightly from the cold. It might be good if I made some hot chocolate to warm you up, said the rector, but Dooley was headed towards the stairs. Barnabas hard on his heels. I can't stand here talking, he said over his shoulder. I got to take a dump. The rector looked at his neighbor, at his neighbor, coloring furiously. Don't look at me, she said. I never raised a boy. Before he called Rodney about the jewels, he called Walter. You're in possession of stolen goods, said Walter. Good Lord. I doubt if Rodney will press any charges, but you ought to know where you stand by failing to report what you found. I knew I should have reported it. It's just that the choir was rehearsing three different performances 
and I was busy with lessons and carols, and Rodney would have conducted a lengthy investigation, and believe me, I understand, but it was still a damn fool thing to do, Walter said. He sat for a moment after talking with Walter, with his head in his hands, then he called Rodney. I've got something I want to show you. How about this morning at Lord's Chapel? Let me stop by the grill and get a coffee to go, and I'll be right over. He felt sick, in possession of stolen goods, a fine thing for a man of the cloth, for heaven's sake. If there were any punishment, it was the nauseating humiliation he felt, which was surely punishment enough. You look like something a cat drug in, said Emma, coming through the door. That's a fine greeting, she said. Die, she said. Dooley Bartle was doing you about as much good as a case of diabetes, if you ask me. He came back last night. What a relief. I wish he'd called me. I did. No answer. Oh, yes. Well, I was at Harold's mama's and we worked on my suit. Your suit? That I'm getting married in. Red, black buttons, peplum, high neck. How I see. Black patent shoes, black hose, pearl earrings. Where was he? His mother's, like we thought. She sent him back, told him she couldn't care for him. Breaks my heart, said Emma. That's encouraging, he thought. But mostly it makes me mad. Ah, here it comes. You get house help, change your diet, get you a nice dog for company, start feeling better, and what happens? He was so astounded to hear Emma refer to Barnabas as a nice dog that he was speechless. What happens is you get a boy who runs you down, wears you out, and worries you half to death, and you're right back where you started. I declare I've seen diabetes make you look better than you look this morning. She caught her breath and plunged ahead. Do you know how old you are? Remind me, he thought, enduring her assault. Not 25, not 32, 60. You're too old to be taken on a boy. Plus do your preaching and go to the hospital and visit the elderly and go to meetings and read in that program with Olivia Davenport, not to mention the bells coming in and the nursing home starting up and that old mangy dog to wash. Now his nice dog was old and mangy. As she continued her oratorical massacre, he came to a sober realization. He would certainly never tell her so, but he had to admit, had to admit one thing. She was right. Dark in here, said Rodney, but it smells good. It's the old wood and years of incense and beeswax and flowers and lemon oil and dried hydrangeas. It's a wonderful smell, he agreed as he switched on the lights. Come down this way. What I want to show you is where we keep the ashes of the departed. They walked down the hall and stopped at the closet, where he removed the key from above the door. Rodney adjusted his holster. Is something going to jump out of there? I fervently hope not. He opened the door and turned on the light, relieved to find that everything was as orderly as he'd left it. No one had tossed in any plastic flowers or worn hymnals. Now, he said, carefully picking up the bronze urn which was situated third from the left, this is Parrish Guthrie. Remember him? Ah, how could I forget the old so-and-so? I wasn't the only one that got a deep breath when he went to his grave, or whatever that thing is. This is an urn. After the body after the body is cremated, the ashes, which are mostly bits of bone, are interred here. Bits of bone, said Rodney, said Rodney, shuddering. I like the old fashioned way, pushing up daisy <laughs> daisies. Let's take this urn and walk on back to the kitchen. His heart was pounding. Oh, how he hated to tell the bitter truth about his wrong behavior. He stood at the sink and unscrewed the cap of the bronze urn, which came off more readily than before. I'm going to show you something very, what is the word? Something that grieves me. With his other hand, he took the white tea towel from the rack and spread it on the drain board. Then he gently shook the urn so that the contents would spill out. Nothing tumbled to the mouth of the urn. He shook it again and turned the urn nearly upside down. There was no rattle as of seashells in a jar, and nothing came rolling onto the towel. He realized there was a good explanation for this. The bronze urn was empty. He felt strangely light-headed and confused. I don't understand. What's the deal? The rector shook the urn. I don't know. I'm... Something was supposed to be in that jar, right? Jewels, he said weakly. Jewels that I found in this very urn sometime before Christmas. I don't get it. Let's sit down. Rodney sat on the stool by the wall phone. Father Tim sat on the old pine table in the center of the room. Before Christmas, he confessed, I was cleaning up that closet, throwing things out. I picked up Parrish's urn and it rattled strangely. I remembered I'd never seen the contents of an urn, so out of curiosity I brought it back here to the kitchen and opened it. 
there were little cloth sacks full of jewels in there, cut jewels. Maybe it was another another jar. Maybe it was another jar you brought back here. No, it was definitely Parrish. Rodney rested his hand on the butt of his pistol. So why didn't you report it? There, there was the question he was dreading. As he explained why, Rodney took off his hat and scratched his head. I don't know, said the chief. I never run up against anything like this. When you found him the first time and didn't report it, you were in possession of stolen goods, I know that. So I'm told by my cousin, who's an attorney. But now that there's nothing here, well, there's nothing I can see to charge you with. Maybe we ought to look in the other jars. The rector shrugged. He didn't think it would do any good. This is creepy, said Rodney, peering into the urns and stirring their contents with a bread knife from the silverware drawer. I wish to the Lord I'd brought, I'd brought me a chew of red, man. Tobacco, I presume. When they finished an hour later, they'd found nothing amiss. I'm just going to write up a report. Hmm. I'm just going to write up a report and you, then you sign it and I'll file it. Where? Where will you file it? In my right-hand drawer over the station. Aha, I thought you might file a report with J.C. Hogan. Not by a dern if I can help it, said Rodney. He felt faint with relief. He had thanked his neighbor for her imaginative gift. He had confessed his unfortunate discovery and equally unfortunate behavior to Rodney. And now there was only one thing left to do on his list, and that was to talk with Hoppy Harper. He felt like calling the airline immediately and flying nonstop to Shannon, then renting a car and driving to Sligo. There he'd spent at least four weeks in a remote inn, riding a bicycle along narrow lanes and tapping his foot to fiddle music played in thatched cottages. Instead of calling the airline, he called Hoppy. Harper... You're good rector here, he said, not feeling very good at all. How's Russell? It's amazing the way the infection is reversing. Not typical in cases like this. How are you? Are you running? Slacked off. I've got three words to say to you, pal. Just do it. Okay, you're right and I will. Let me ask you something. I need to, I need to talk with you about an important matter. Your place or mine? Mine, if it's okay with you. Everybody from here to Wesley and back has upper respiratory infections. I can't leave. Say when. Round six. I'll be there. He put the phone down. It was the first time he'd had a moment to catch his breath, and the jewels came instantly to mind. Why were they gone from the urn? Why would they have been moved? Did somebody know he'd found them? He felt an odd chill, and he did not like the feeling. Viral myocarditis. Viral myocarditis. Hoppy looked as if, been, as if he'd been struck. Good God, he said. He said quietly and sat back in his chair. Father Tim looked at the notes he'd taken while Olivia told her story. The condition was complex and he tried to assemble the facts accurately. The doctor leaned forward. Tell me everything she said. It began with what she thought was flu about two years ago. No energy, said Hoppy. Shortness of breath, chest discomfort. That's right. She said she felt like she was falling apart. She went to the doctor, took antibiotics, accelerated her vitamins, got plenty of rest, but nothing worked. They gave her a battery of blood tests and didn't find anything. Typical. Finally, they did an EKG and saw some abnormalities. Then an echocardiogram, which showed an enlarged heart. Then the biopsy, said Hoppy. Right, viral myocarditis. The doctor looked ashen. The symptoms... The symptoms waxed and waned. She would have perfectly normal times, just like she's had since coming to Mitford. Then severe flare-ups when she could hardly breathe and scarcely walk for the edema in her legs. The flare-ups are totally unpredictable. Who's her doctor? A man from your old alma mater, Mass General. Leo Baldwin, I hope. He checked his notes. Exactly. Leo Baldwin. The best. I know him. Stunning credentials. What happened when she had the tissue biopsy? Coxsackie B, she said. They tried medication, but the side effects were gruesome. Affected her blood count. You've seen termites in action? Hoppy, said, Hoppy asked. Yes, right under my back steps, more's the pity. Coxsackie eats away like that, at the heart muscle. Vile, insidious, incurable. Why hasn't she had a transplant? You understand the chances of finding a donor with a normal blood type? 75? 101? Add to that the chance of finding a donor with a B blood type. Thousands to one. 
and then the chances of getting the heart to the patient with the right kind of timing. Hobby removed his glasses and rubbed his eyes. Crap, he said softly. He called Walter. Not there. You mean just vanished. The urn was empty. Look, Timothy, you've been pressing hard. You haven't had a vacation in years, and no, I'm not seeing things, and it was not my imagination. The jewels were there before Christmas. I only opened one little sack. There must have been 15 or 20 stones in it, and I could see there were others, other little cheesecloth sacks just like it. He sighed. There is, however, one comfort in all this, which is I'm no longer in possession of stolen goods. Chapter 13, Issues of the Heart. He's hardly speaking to me, said Olivia. Percy came over to their booth, wiping his hands on the worn apron. I don't believe I've had the pleasure, he said to Olivia. Meet Olivia Davenport, said Father Tim. Olivia Davenport, Percy Mosley, the owner of this venerable establishment. When we were in for breakfast, he was out with the flu. She smiled and extended her hand. I hear your calf's liver with onions is four star. She didn't hear it from me, said the rector. Well, the father's here and... Well, the father here don't like it, nor Miss Rose, but the rest of us ain't so hard to satisfy. I look forward to deciding for myself. For you, said Percy, obviously enchanted, we can have it back on the specials by Tuesday. Well, then, look for me at noon on Tuesday. Percy went away in such ecstasy that the rector feared for his angina condition. Barely speaking, asked the rector. I know what it is, of course. He's afraid. Yes, of course, and he's ashamed. What do you mean? I mean that he wants very much to be brave, to let his feelings for you grow. But as well as fearing the pain, I believe he's ashamed of the fear. Olivia's brow furrowed as she considered that. Yes, yes, I understand that. Also, I feel that Hoppy is... Is what? She asked eagerly. Is thinking. Thinking. He knows your doctor. No, Leo. He knows Leo. She was obviously thrilled with this news. Hoppy interned at Mass General. Olivia laughed with unbridled warmth. The sparkle danced again in her eyes. Mass General is like home. I spent so much of my life there. Why, just talking about it makes me suddenly almost homesick. And Hoppy, he interned there and, and knows Leo. She said this softly, as if it gave her great comfort. I believe Hoppy may be thinking of how you could, that is, what he might do if... A transplant? No, it's too much. I've given up. The chances, the risks, nothing is in my favor. Father, I promise you I can't do it. Well, Olivia, all I can say to you is that all I can say to you to that is Philippians four thirteen. She laughed easily. I love it when you talk like that. Emma handed him the phone, looking tentative. Harold's preacher, she said. My good brother, said the voice on the line, this is Absalom Greer. Orchard keeper, general store operator, pastor of three little churches and all-around worker in the vineyards of the Lord. Pastor Greer, said the rector, instantly attracted to the tone of his caller's voice. What can I do for you this morning? Well, my friend, since we're to perform a ceremony together, I'd be beholden to you if we could have a mite of fellowship. Consider it done, he said with warm anticipation. Consider it done. I declare, he told Puny on Wednesday, if Dooley and I don't get out to Meadowgate soon, Rebecca Jane will be in college. When's the baptizing? Two weeks hence. The weather has been so variable with rain or snow nearly every Sunday that I've never laid eyes on her. I'd like to hold a baby, Puny said wistfully. Well then, young lady, go find yourself a husband. Ha! Huh, there's not a soul out there I'd pick. How can you know that when you've limited the picking to Mitford and Wesley? That was a good question, he thought. Mama said, you don't go hunting. You let them kind of go by you in a parade. Yes, well, that may be. But have you seen any parades going by lately? She sighed. What do you want for supper? You're asking me? Well, for a change, I thought I'd ask, instead of leaving a surprise. Puny, please do not try to fix a thing that ain't broke. She stared at him. What kind of talk is that? I mean that I fervently beseech you to keep doing exactly what you're doing. Your surprises are my unending delight. She smiled gratefully, but a little weakly, he thought, as she paired his clean socks. Puny, he said, I faithfully pray for you each day, but I believe I'm going to add something to the prayer. 
I'm going to ask the Lord to start the parade. Puny blushed and lowered her eyes. He was astounded to see a tear creep down her freckled cheek. Without knowing why, it touched him so deeply that he turned away. He heard her blow her nose. Cornbread, she said suddenly with great feeling. Cornbread? She flew to the stove drawer. I'm going to make you a cake of cornbread. I don't care what your doctor says. And I'm putting salt in it and bacon drippings and frying it in Crisco because I'm tired of holding back on my good cornbread. Well then, he said with admiration, just do it. The weather on Thursday morning was grim. He'd been aware of rain all night long and sometime around four o'clock, Dooley crept into his bedroom. On hearing a noise, he and Barnabas sat straight up. Seeing only a silhouette in the doorway, Barnabas growled darkly. Oh, shut up, said Dooley. I ain't no burglar. I come to say I'm freezing my tailbone in there. He got up and turned the thermostat to 60, and Dooley stomped back to bed. The floor was like ice, and the rain beat against the windows in sheets. At five, just before he was to get up for morning prayer and study, the wind began. It lashed the trees outside his bedroom window. Window groaned against the rectory, around the rectory, and made him recall the ominous forecast that ice would coat the streets like glass by mid-morning. He remembered, too, that this was the day Luella was to arrive in Mitford and begin life again at Fernbank. He went to the window and looked down at the, little, at the little house next door. A lamp burned in an upstairs window, a pool of warm light in the dark and pouring rain. Well then, Lord, he said aloud as he stood there, is this another memo from you about taking my car to Lou Boyd so I could start driving again? How will I get the boy? How will the boy get to school and all this? And how can I make it to the hospital in all this downpour? Downpour. He heard a sound behind him. Is that you talking in here? It is. Well, it sounds creepy with this old storm of blowing and you sitting here in the dark yammering to yourself. Yammering, is it? It just sounds kind of like yammer, 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 yammer. He looked down at the boy's anxious face and put his arm around his shoulders. Dooley. Dooley hesitated, then he said it. Yes, sir? What if we do something different today? What's that? What if we stay home and play with that train, my cousin said. Dooley hollered so loud that Barnabas leapt off the bed and ran into the hallway, barking at his shadow on the wall. That's a great idea. Boy, that's a great idea. Would you be willing to admit, then, that preachers could occasionally have a great idea? Yeah, yes, sir. Boys, howdy. And while we're at it, why don't we have some of our favorite things, like hot chocolate with three marshmallows and chili and popcorn and apple pie with ice cream and a bit of Wordsworth? Yuck. And stay in our robes and pajamas. Cool. At 8.30, I'm going to call your school and say, Dooley Barlow is not sick today, but if he came out in this weather, he would surely get sick, so look for him tomorrow. Without a word, Dooley took the rector's hand and shook it vigorously. Early the following morning, the leaden skies cleared, the sun came out, and the village stirred briskly. After his hospital visit, he made a phone call to Lou Boyd, who agreed to do whatever it took to get his car running. Then he drove to Wesley on his motor scooter, took the driver's license test, and by grace alone, he later said, passed it. Lou Boyd was looking out the window when he saw the rector walking past the war, man war monument toward the station. Here he comes, boys, he said, cutting himself a plug of tobacco. Been 20 years since he's drove a car, announced Coot Hendrick. No, it ain't, said Bailey Coffee. It's been 14, maybe 15. Ain't none of you got it right, said Lou. Last time he drove that Buick was eight years ago. I looked up where I drained the fluid. Time flies, said Coot, dumping a pack of peanuts in his bottled Coke. Boys, said Father Tim, coming in the front door. She looks good. Lou went down his list. We washed her, waxed her, put on your radials, put in your fluids, give your battery, vacuumed her up, spot cleaned your front seat, washed your mats, filled her up, run around the block, honked the horn, and tried out the radio. I heard my favorite song, said Coot. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. We all just piled in and rode around if you want to know the truth, Bailey Coffee confessed. Here's the bill, said Lou, and I don't mind telling you it's a whopper. Coot patted the Dinette chair next to his. You'd better sit down is all I can say. 
$486.78, director asked. That includes your peaches and cream deodorant spray. A bargain, he declared, and shook Lou's hand with enthusiasm. They followed him to the car. Boys, said Lou, as the rector started the ignition, since he ain't drove in a good while, I'd step back if I was you. They stood watching as the car cruised around the monument and disappeared down Main Street, where several people turned and stared in complete disbelief at the sight of the local priest driving a car, apparently absorbed in his own thoughts, but actually listening intently to the country and western station on his radio, which was playing a number called About the Shoes That Just Walked Out on Me. <laughs> country and western tunes. During the service the following Sunday, he asked the congregation if anyone had seen his Bible, which he described in minute detail. Black, embossed with his name in gold, leather, worn, small, red letter edition, marked in the margins. Not a soul raised a hand, stood up, confessed, or otherwise gave any indication of its whereabouts. He didn't know why such a thought occurred to him, but he felt he should search the church, the basement, the attic, that sort of thing. Too many things were missing. Something felt oddly out of place, like a picture hanging crooked on the wall. It was after dark when he walked to Lord's Chapel, noticing the sign on the front door of the Oxford as he passed. Away, it read which was Andrew's unique language for closed. He'd heard that Andrew had left last week on his biannual trip to England to buy antiques and meet with the society that collected Churchill memorabilia. The grey Mercedes would not be parked at the curb for a while, which gave him a puzzling sense of relief. Arriving at the church, he turned on all the lights and went first to the basement. He searched the sprawling, unfinished room thoroughly, even looking into the surplus food cabinets where they stored canned goods for church suppers. On the few occasions he'd looked in this cabinet, he'd seen it full, as Esther Bollock was the major domo of all kitchen activities and a real crackerjack at keeping supplies on hand. This time it was nearly empty. They were even low on toilet paper. Have you ever tried to go to the Johnny over at the Baptists? Esther, oh. Have you ever tried to go to the Johnny over at the Baptists? Esther once said. They never have any toilet paper. You have to use the Kleenex in your pocket if you're lucky enough to have any. It had been a particular ambition of Esther's never to run out of this commodity at Lord's Chapel. On entering the parish hall, he was surprised to smell the unmistakable odour of chicken noodle soup. He would know that smell anywhere, having lived off that particular soup during his early years in the priesthood. There was no indication that anyone had been in the church. No meetings were scheduled. Altar Guild never worked on Sunday, having a tradition of cleaning up on Monday, and Russell lay sick in the hospital. He felt the sudden foreboding. Something was wrong, very wrong. He could sense it, and he didn't like it. At the left of the altar, he reached up and pulled the chain that brought down the attic stairs. Why in heaven's name anyone would have put attic stairs near the altar was beyond him. However, the chain did make a fine place to attach a flower basket during spring and summer services. Chicken noodle soup. As he turned on the attic lights and climbed the creaking steps, he smelled it more distinctly than before. In his twelve years at Lord's Chapel, he had been in the attic only once, and found it as large as the loft of a New England barn. According to Miss Sadie, they had built the church with room for growth of the Sunday school. As his eyes came level with the floor of the loft, he saw nothing but a vast, empty space filled with shadows. It was strangely restful to stand in this place, without fret and clutter of things. He noticed something lying near the window in the corner, but when he walked over to it, he saw that it was only a candy wrapper. Home of Troy, one of his favorites. He picked it up. He could smell the tiniest scent of chocolate on the wrapper. He put the wrapper in his pants pocket and walked to the door that opened into the nearly empty belfry. Three of the enormous bells were gone from their oak mountings. The fourth, the great and solemn death bell, as it was called, stood silent in the corner of the Norman Tower. What was he looking for, anyway? He asked himself. Perhaps he hoped the jewels would turn up again somewhere on the premises, and Rodney Underwood would take them away, and the whole incident would be off his mind and out of his hands. After all, wasn't it possible that whoever put them in the urn might have moved them to another hiding place in the church? If nothing else, he was able to see the pristine condition of the old building, even in the poor light from naked bulbs. He closed the door to the belfry and walked on to the stairs. Very likely, he thought, the theft of Esther Bollock's marmalade cake had been an inside job, a practical joke by one of the many fervent admirers of that famous cake. And his Bible would turn up in some unexpected place that, after all, would make perfect sense. The jewels, however, were another matter. 
He had hoped to come up from the basement or down from the attic, feeling some sort of peace, but the matter of the jewels would give him no peace at all. When he went home from the office on Monday, Puny was standing at the door waiting. He could see the fire in her eyes before he opened the door, before he opened the screen. This is a pleasant surprise, he said, seeing that it wasn't going to be pleasant at all. You're usually gone when I get home. Are you still praying that parade prayer, she demanded as he came in with a quart of milk and a loaf of bread. Parade? Prayer? You know, the one that asked the Lord to let the parade begin? Ah, well, yes. Yes, I am. She glowered at him. If you don't mind, I'd appreciate it if you'd tell the Lord to stop the parade. Well, now, he said, putting the grocery bag down and sitting on his counter stool. What's going on? The very day we talked, I went to the local to get those nectarines Avis was raving about, and I'm standing there by the produce, and this old coot walks up to me and goes, Well, little lady, where you been all my life? He had his jaw stuck so full of tobacco it would have gagged a bit ago. He followed me around till I nearly had to smack him to get him to leave me alone. The very next day, Puny continued, quite red in the face, I was minding my own business at the mall, trying to buy you some wash rags, and this big galoot slithers up to me like a snake and says, Want to go get some chicken fingers at the arcade? Chicken fingers. I showed him chicken fingers. Puny, he said, when you go to parade, do you like every float that passes? I like some better than others, she said grudgingly. Well then, I don't know. I think you should pray some other prayer. This and scares me to death. You wait, he said mildly. This is only the start-up. We haven't got to the drum and bugle corps yet, much less to the marching bands. Whatever that's supposed to mean, she said, thoroughly disgusted. That evening before dinner, he built a fire. Dooley made popcorn, and Barnabas did his business at the hedge with great expediency. He was as glad as a child for the comfort of home and rest and peace. But what he estimated to be the fourth or fifth time, he picked up the Mitford Muse, which was by now four days old, and tried to read Esther Cunningham's editorial on the July Festival of Roses. J.C. had done it again. Festival of Ropes will transform Main Street said the headline. Dooley answered the ringing phone in the kitchen. Gregory, yep, he's here, but he don't want to talk to nobody. Dooley put his hand over the receiver and yelled, It's your doctor. Hang up, he said, and lifted the cordless by the sofa. Got anything for exhaustion, sleeplessness, and general aggravation? He asked. I was calling to ask you the same thing. The blind leading the blind. How are you, my friend? This place is eating me alive. I've got to get out of here for a while, and the kitchen said they'd make me a plate. I wondered if I could bring it to your place. Dining out, it's called. Of course, he said, trying to conceal the weariness in his voice. I'll bring you a plate, too. I don't know, said the rector with some caution. What do you uh, think it might be? God only knows. I've had that a few times. Bring it on, then. I need more surprises in my life. Yuck, said Dooley. Don't give me any of that stuff. I ate something off Grandpa's plate the other day at the hospital, and it liked to gag me. Thanks for reminding me. I'll just have me some popcorn, peanut butter and jelly, and fried bologna. Yuck, said the rector. When in heaven's name are you going to get some help? He asked. Hmm. When in heaven's name are you going to get some help? He asked his doctor. They were sitting by the fire with trays on their laps. Soon. That's what you always say, and soon never comes. Here you are, a Harvard Medical School graduate who could practice anywhere in the country, and you've chosen our obscure little village in the work of three men. A man from Wesley will be spending a couple of afternoons with me, starting soon. Good doctor, Wilson. You'll like him. Young. A lamb to the slaughter. Hoppy grinned. So, what do you think of the cuisine? Well now, words fail me. Come on, we're talking chicken cordon bleu here. He laughed. If that's what you're talking, my friend, we are clearly speaking two different languages. Hoppy gulped down his food, a habit encouraged by overwork and understaffing, and leaned back in the wing chair. I need you to check me on something, he said, looking into the fire. Proceed. I don't know where I'm going with this. Maybe nowhere. He was silent for some time, as the fire crackled. Barnabas got up from his master's feet and went and lay next to Hoppy's. This simple act of... This act of simple consolation was one of the was only one of the reasons Father Tim admired his dog's character. 
When Carol was dying, there was nothing I could do. All I could do was control the pain. It was, it was hopeless. Yes, it was. It was hopeless. Hoppy turned from the fire. Severe myocarditis isn't hopeless, he said with feeling. Keep going, which means I'm not helpless. I hear you. Hoppy stood up and paced the floor. I'm scared out of my mind. I hardly know this woman. We spent some time at the art show. I see her at church. We've had coffee in the staff room. And of course I see what she's doing for my patients. She's the best medicine we've got up there. Father Tim heard Duty running his bathwater upstairs. Track me here and see if I'm making sense. I'm with you. Severe myocarditis is not hopeless for one reason only, transplants. But this option is complicated by her blood type. Who knows whether we could find a compatible donor in a hundred years? And when we found one, would she be in stable enough condition to receive the heart? Another thing, it can't be just anybody with her blood type. It will take somebody who's about her same weight. It's a scary business, but what I'm saying is this. He stood in front of the fire, his tall, lanky frame cast into shadow. I hardly know this woman, but I feel something for her that's so strong, so compelling, that I want to help her. I want to stick my neck out and help her. I want her to have a heart that works. I want... What do you want? I want her to live, Hoppy said softly. I want that with you. Get behind me in prayer, will you? I will. You'll think I'm crazy, but I've been running down all the scenarios. I've got a friend in Wesley who's a pilot. He's not always easy to find, but we're 20 minutes to his plane. And if I can find Millard, there's a little charter service... And if I can't find Millard, there's a little charter service at the same strip with a couple of Cessnas. Wherever they harvest the heart, it could be put on ice until we arrive, or it could be packed in ice and flown to Boston. I'm going to talk to Leo Baldwin at Mass General. Father Tim felt strangely shaken and joyful. We can get her on a national waiting list, and if a blood type comes up, we'd have to move immediately. She'll have to wear a beeper, and I'd like you to have one too. When that thing goes off, pal, we're talking on your knees. He felt the sobering impact of such a plan. It would mean they would all have to be accessible every hour of every day. A call could come any time from anywhere, said Hoppy. We may even be able to keep the donor alive, keep the heart pumping until we get her wherever we have to go. Would that be desirable? The longer it's in the physiological state, the better. I see. Hoppy rubbed his eyes and sat down again, wearily. What do I tell her? He asked his concerned host. That I am willing to go out of my way, complicate my life, turn my practice upside down for God knows how long, just because I'm a nice guy? How do I keep... What would she think my reasons are for getting involved like this? Father Tim sat forward on the sofa. I suggest you don't concern yourself with what she thinks. You're a doctor. Your business is saving lives. But according to you, she's turned off the transplant idea completely. Leo Baldwin has probably walked her through all these scenarios. She's considered them seriously and dumped the option, period. So who's going to sell her? Probably not me, probably not you. Who then? God, he said simply. Tell me more. If we're going to be a team, my friend, we must think like a team. And to do that, we need to agree in prayer. Count me in. Neither you nor I may be able to convince her about this transplant. But if God thinks it's best for her, it's just a matter of time. Let's go for it, Hoppy said. The two men bowed their heads, and Barnabas rested his on the doctor's foot. After his friend left, he sat for a while on the sofa. Then he went upstairs, said goodnight to Dooley, and took a hot shower. But an hour after getting into bed, the adrenaline was pumping so fast and furiously that he lay sleepless until three o'clock. At four, he woke exhausted and lay staring at his moonlit window until dawn. He wondered about his recent creeping fatigue. His running had been sporadic, and he'd let a few taboo foods slip back into his diet. But his indiscretions had been minor in that regard, no more than a piece of cornbread, a sliver of chocolate. Dear God, what a hideous feeling to go down for the count when he'd spent most of his life in good, glowing health. Glowing good health. He wondered as he lay there about the helplessness of the elderly, about people who couldn't move their limbs or walk to the barbershop or get up and go to the toilet. He had, he had devoted his life to intercessory prayer. Pardon me. Intercessory prayer. 
Hmm. Asking little for himself. Trusting in God's provisions and seeing that trust confirmed on every side. But he lay now feeling that his very essence was somehow draining away and pray, praying fervently for his own strength, for wisdom and renewal. The baptism was truly a blessed event. When he held her in his arms and said, Rebecca Jane, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. A great warmth flowed through him and the infant stirred, infant stirred in his arms and looked into his eyes. At the reception in the parish hall, they were standing in line to hold the amiable Rebecca Jane, whose green eyes, stand-up strawberry hair, and dimpled chin were melting hearts by the score. Though Dooley didn't attempt to hold her, he stayed by the side of anyone who did, looking at her intently and marveling. I like this baby, he told Father Tim. I like this baby better than, better than snuff, I suppose. Nope, better than goose down Owen. That's quite a compliment. But her hair's funny. Looks kind of like a stump full of granddaddy spiders. Every baby is special, the rector told Marge, who had finally reclaimed her daughter from the eager parishioners. But there's something quite different about Rebecca Jane. I sense a spirit that's very rich with God's promise. I sense that too, she said, kissing her baby's downy head. It was inspiring to see Luella's broad mahogany face smiling at him these days from the gospel side. Her presence brought something nourishing to the spirit of the congregation, like raisins added to bread. She also made an addition with her fruity mezzo voice, which she lifted with surprising strength in the Anglican hymns, learned as a girl in this very church. She makes me feel young, said Miss Sadie, when Father Tim visited Fernbank for lunch. When I'm around Luella, it's like being close to Mama again, all over again. Did you know Miss Sadie rocked me in her arms when I was a baby? Luella said proudly. So when I'm around Miss Sadie, I feel young myself. We don't know who raised who, said the mistress of Fernbank. A very nice kettle of fish, thought the pleased rector. On Thursday evening, it occurred to him that he had never invited his neighbor to attend a service at Lord's Chapel. What kind of hospitality was that, he asked himself, as he dialed her number. I don't mind telling you, he confessed, that I've been wanting to invite you to a church service, but, well, I keep forgetting to do it. And I apologize. Do you soak your beans? Asked Cynthia. Why, yes. Yes, I do, he said, taken aback. I just love to cook a pot of beans, but you will never guess what I did a few days ago, speaking of forgetting. I can't imagine, he said, which was the truth, if he'd ever told it. I was soaking a big pot of beans, and I put the lid on the pot and set them on the stove, and a week later there was this horrible smell, and I thought something had died in my kitchen, that Violet had, well, you know... Killed a mouse? Exactly. But guess what it was? It was those beans. I'd simply forgotten they were in the pot and they just, well, spoiled. Exactly. So don't feel bad if you can't remember to ask me to church. Well then, I won't feel a bit bad. But whenever you'd like to come, please know you'll be welcomed by one and all. I've been going to the Presbyterians, she said. But yes, I will come soon. After the invitation to his neighbor, he called the hospital to check on Russell. Nurse Herman said he had sent his dinner back barely touched, insisting that he could have cooked it, himself, cooked it better himself, so she figured he was improving, and could the liver please bring a pound of liver mush the next time he came to the hospital, as it wasn't something they ordinarily bought, and Russell said he would give a war pension for some. He also insisted, reported Nurse Herman, that he would go down to the kitchen personally fry it himself, and Dr. Doctor Harper said, fine, fry him some too. Can you imagine? Liver mush, Father Tim wrote on his list of things to do. We're almost at the end of the chapter, so we have four more pages to go. So we'll finish up, even though we're going a bit long today. After a useless and frustrating meeting on Friday afternoon, he decided to take Barnabas on a long walk. When Dooley left on his bicycle to do Fernback chores, he headed toward Little Mitford Creek with Barnabas straining at the leash. The wet winter promised a glorious spring. And here and there, pushing through sodden leaf mold, were furtive shoots of green that gladdened his heart. He loved the smell of the woods and the damp alluvial soil that covered these mountains like a blanket. Smoke was boiling out of the chimney. The great aluminum tub that Homeless used for bathing was hanging on the side of the house, and a colorful wash was on the line. Homeless answered the door, leaning on his crutch and swaddled head to toe in a worn blanket. Well, sir, if it ain't the clergy, 
Come in, come in, make yourself at home. The rector and his dog discovered a roaring fire in the old stove, a soup pot simmering on top, and a book on the, on the little table where an oil lamp burned to get the fading afternoon light. In the corner stood the neatly made cot with two worn quilts folded at the foot. I declare, Holmes, I can move in here and be happy as a clam. Happy as a hogging slop is what I am. Sit down right there, he said, offering his only chair to the rector, who took it, knowing that it pleased his host to offer him the best seat in the house. Homeless settled on the wood box between the table and the stove. My friend, said the rector, I am feeling the ills of the world these days. I thought I'd come visit a man with some plain sense. You're visiting a man so plain he's sitting here with no breeches on. One pair is hanging on clothesline, and I give the other pair away. Fellow lives up the creek yonder with too ragged to look for work, so I stepped out of my pants and he put them on and headed to town. You probably don't want to get that that plain yourself. No, no, I don't. You're right. That's too plain for me. Sometimes you have to gag on fancy before you can appreciate plain the way I see it. For too many years I ate fancy, I dressed fancy, I talked fancy. A while back I decided decided to start talking the way I was raised to talk. Now, for the first time in 40 years, I can understand what I'm saying. They laughed easily. Right here is the way I've talked for a lot of years. Right here is the way I talked for a lot of years, said Homeless. You might have thought I had a degree from some fine college. It was a real paste-up job, you might say, he grinned. Well, that's the end of my demonstration on talking fancy. I'd find it interesting to know what you did all those years in advertising. Leaning against the wall in a straight-backed chair gave the rector an odd sense of relief, as if he'd run away to the creek and left his worries behind. I was what you'd call an account man. Toothpaste, beer, and automotive was my category, with a little stint on banking and breakfast cereals. It was when I went on breakfast cereals that liquor got me. If I'd have been around when that oat brand thing hit, something worse than liquor might have got me. Homeless stood up and opened the stove door and poked the log with the stick. The blanket shifted and slipped toward the floor, but he grabbed it, adjusted it, and sat back down, grinning broadly. There is every temptation in the world for me to get another pair of pants, but I'm fighting it. Father Tim laughed heartily. Bottom line is, I was drunk for 30 years. 30 years. It astounds me to this very day. I signed contracts, made presentations, drove cars, flew planes, directed meetings, and stayed half shot the whole time. I lost three wives. Nine jobs, four houses, two kids, and one foot. The only thing I didn't lose was my self-respect, and that's because I didn't have any. Barnabas listened intently. You might say I did everything I could to earn the name homeless and live up to it. And now that things are different, and I've been sober for nine years, I don't try to dodge my name. It reminds me what I was. Homeless, sick, slobbering in the gutter. God almighty. What brought you back here? I asked myself where I'd been the happiest, and it was right here back home where I was raised. They were hard times when I was coming up, but they was good times. And I got to the place where I'd seen it all. I'd made the big money, had the big expense accounts, the whole nine yards. I turned myself in to dry out and I stayed dry. I sold everything, paid my debts and turned up in Wesley with 60 bucks in my pocket. Did you ever look back? I never looked back. The fire crackled in the stove. I don't mind telling you I'm curious about the kind of terms you're on with God. We talk, said Homeless. We're definitely on speaking terms. I'm no all-out pagan by a long shot. I was raised in the church and baptized as a boy, but there's something lacking and I don't know what it is. It's like something's itching me, won't let me be. I can't name it, to tell you the truth. I don't want to think about it. You know how the town churches do, bringing me this to eat and that to eat, trying to get me to sit in the pew you people come back in here to the creek, they make me feel like a frog. You're trying to gig. The rector had fished a stick out of the wood basket. It was a comfort to turn it in his hand to look at the knots and the grain. He felt the urge to whittle on it with a knife, but no urge to speak. Homeless was right. Now that's a hateful thing for a man to say, but I can talk to you. I can level with you. I appreciate that, my friend. Once in a while I need to talk to somebody I can level with myself. You can level with me any time, but right now said Homeless, picking up his crutch. I'm going to jump in here and lay on some supper and give you something to eat for a change. He lifted the lid on the soup pot, and out of it wafted a fragrance so heavenly that his guest was transfixed. I'm afraid I won't be able to stay. I've got a boy who'll be wanting his dinner. 
I've got a nice big ham bone down in here for old Barnabas, said the host, stirring the soup with a long handled spoon. Barnabas beat the floor with his tail. You don't know how we'd like to stay, but the boy, how old is this boy? asked Thomas, setting aside a cast iron griddle, setting a cast iron griddle on the stovetop. Dooley's eleven. When I was eleven, my daddy had a big farm to the other side of Wesley. From the time my mama died, I got up at four every morning, made breakfast for three little young'uns, milked the cows, cleaned up the kitchen, and walked to school. If that boy can't make himself a jam sandwich, set me a place, said Father Tim. I got a deal with Avis, Homeless confided, laying a second helping into his guest bowl. Ladling a second helping into his guest bowl. All he throws out, I go through. But don't worry that your soup's not sanitary. Sanitary. I brought the cabbage home and washed it good. Cleaned the potatoes with a scrub brush, cut the soft spots out of the onion, gored a bad place out of the rude beggar, and put it all on the boil after I took my bath and done my washing. I keep busy. I'm not one to lollygag. Rector thought this might be the best soup he'd ever put in his mouth, and he didn't even like rutabagas. Homeless waved his hand over their supper, which included mugs of steaming coffee and the hot day-old bread he'd toasted on the griddle and buttered. I paid for the coffee and the butter, but not another morsel. There's probably less than 25 cents in this whole deal. That's a deal, all right. Come spring, I won't even be paying for the coffee. I'm going to dig a mess of chicory roots. Mess of chicory roast the roots and grind them up. You boil that of a morning and drink it, and it'll set your feet on the floor. All things considered, my friend, I count you among the richest folks in Mitford. Homeless winked and laughed his rasping laugh. That man is the richest whose pleasures are the cheapest. Thoreau, said Father Tim. Dead right, beamed his host. When he and Barnabas came out onto Lilac Road at Winnie Ivy's cottage, he felt as if he'd been away on a vacation. Why pay a fortune to fly to Sligo for a month? he asked aloud in the gathering dusk, when I can spend an hour or two on Mitford Creek. He hardly noticed the car that drove slowly toward them across the narrow bridge, its lights on low beam, but Barnabas did. He barked viciously, lunging with all his might as the car slowed down and seemed about to stop. Just then, one of Rodney Underwood's men came down Lilac Road in a patrol car. He could barely control the furious energy straining at the leash as the rusted impala gunned the engine and shot past them, belching fumes obnoxious exhaust. And that's the end of the chapter. Tune in later for our next chapter, chapter 14. Um, probably tomorrow. I have some other things going on. Um, but yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow's Thursday. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow at 8.30. Stay safe, stay healthy. See you then.